Welcome back to the Art and Science of Real Estate Negotiation podcast with Tom Zeeb. Happy to be interviewing a successful student of mine today named Sam Glavin. Sam, how are you? Good. How are you? Awesome. Thanks. So, Sam, where are you located these days? Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin. Awesome. And introduce yourself to everybody. Tell them how you got into real estate, where you're at, what kind of real estate you're doing. Yep. Yeah. So I graduated from W. Stevens Point here in Wisconsin in 2020. March of 2020, I moved to Madison because all my classes went online through the COVID. And while I was doing that, I had a house under contract and I was frantically driving to all these RIAs trying to wholesale to somebody. And through that, I ended up meeting somebody that was doing coaching, Chris Haig. I know you know him. And basically told me it was a dud deal. I've had it under contract for too much. And so I stopped that. I started working with Chris and that's kind of how I got into the real estate game. Basically a lot of wholesaling and wholetailing. And right now I'm actually working on like my first actual rehab, like putting 65 grand into it. So yeah, started off with like the, I feel like how everybody starts off wholesaling, wholetailing, and now trying to get into my own rehabs at this point. Gotcha. Let's talk about what's changed. So it sounds like, I mean, you... You graduated during a very interesting time in the midst of COVID. And what brought you into entrepreneurial real estate instead of what everyone else graduates college and thinks they're doing? Yeah, so I kind of jumped into college not knowing what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be some sort of entrepreneur. And yeah, well, when COVID hit, I was applying for jobs. I had interviews lined up and yeah, right as that was going on, people were telling me, hey, we're holding off on taking on anybody because lots of them were letting people go at that time. And I honestly, it worked out perfect because so March 2020, that's when I really started actually running a business. Like I started my marketing and everything. And so four months later in August of 2020, I did that first deal. Nice. But to uh, get into, but yeah, it was a professor really that he had lived out in California his whole life. He was retired teaching in Wisconsin, where he's originally from. And he was like the professor that I feel like everybody needs. He's not like, a, he didn't go to school to be a teacher. He was a real estate investor and he knew everything from wholesaling. He knew everything about real estate investing. So that's really what got me into the real estate world. And yeah, not having to go get your W-2 type job. So Gotcha. So it was the professor who was the least, the kind of the professor least interested in in just teaching a class and more interested in teaching your life. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. What were you studying? Business administration. And it was like it was there was actually like an entrepreneurial type. I forget what it was called, but it pertained to real estate. So I got to take real estate classes, luckily through him, because yeah, I mean, even like the textbook. I mean, we really didn't even use that. We were talking about like investing, like we talk about like not like agents or that type of stuff. It was very investor oriented. Gotcha. Interesting. How old are you, Sam? 25 now. 25. Cool. Now, what was your start like? So you had some successes when you were still in college or wrapping up and what you said, a couple of them didn't work, a couple of them fumbled. Talk me through the early part of what it was like getting in the real estate and what it was like getting in the real estate at a young age. Yeah, it was really was, I mean, early on. So yeah, I wasn't doing any types of marketing. I was like calling Fizbo's and doing that type of stuff, which like, those are the hardest deals to find. And then, yeah, after I actually started doing the marketing, I'm like, one thing Chris always taught me is like, whoever has the marketing has the deals. And that's when I like really started pounding on marketing. I was doing mailers and then got into Facebook. But yeah, funny that you say it, because I think I had maybe three, three or four under contract before I actually had one that was viable and was actually a deal. So yeah, it was four months. I remember going through all my leads and stuff. I think I'd spent like, I think I was doing $300 a month on marketing was my budget. And yeah, after four months had gotten that first deal, I think there was like 50 leads. Cause I remember I was so excited. I was trying to just get everything down, but yeah. So four months, I think maybe like two grand in marketing, finally got a deal. And literally I put 
I think we put two grand into it. Literally, I did me and my brothers. I uh, got two dumpsters out there. We hauled everything out to the dumpsters. I actually had my mom. She like owned like a small cleaning business. She cleaned the whole place out and we listed it. And yeah, we ended up making 30 grand on it. So <laughs> yeah, I was ecstatic for sure. Right. So four grand, four grand in some sweat equity, right? A little bit of physical labor and yep. then 30 grand out of it. So good. You cleared a good 26 grand. Yes. Yep. In four months time. How'd that feel? It was the best feeling ever. That's when I was like, man, I really don't have to get a job. Just keep this going and I'll be good. What did your college friends think about that? I've only talked to like two of them since. And they were, were all on the same path. Like we all talked about entrepreneurship. So yeah, I didn't have much guff about it. They, I, We were all trying to like reach that point where we could make money doing our own thing. So nice. Nice. Yeah, it's cool to be able to get out in your own. Most people's college experience is, is kind of different. You know, even, even if they think they want entrepreneurship, it, you, somehow people wind up in management or, you know, even running a small company, but they're usually running someone else's something instead of their own something. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Not bad. So you uh, got involved locally found a local mentor, local group, got yourself moving. What was it? Why'd you choose to come into my program if you already had other support? Yeah. So I did my first three deals with him. I've spent just about a year now since I joined yours. I went to the RIA I'd always been going to. And just from listening, mainly what got me was you were kept on talking about all this marketing we were going to get for free and like this thumb drive and it's going to have everything that we could possibly need. And I was like, this is the most like plug and play thing because like my main focus is marketing. I try to find any new ways of marketing. Every time I'm networking with people and they're doing deals, I'm always asking like, what type of marketing are you doing? So that was like the biggest thing that made me jump in. Granted, like we have like the in-person masterminds and stuff like that, but yeah, it was all the marketing that came with it. And yeah, because immediately I started doing some of your pre-foreclosure letters, probate letters. And I kid you not, two months into sending pre-foreclosures, I got a deal and I do a bunch of Facebook marketing and stuff, but this deal from this mailer was the biggest deal I had ever gotten. So I'm continuing to do the mailers and stuff. But yeah, I mean, it was the marketing. I'm like, all this marketing was practically free. Like we get all the, the mastermind and networking stuff. And then we just get this pile of I mean because copywriting and all that stuff like that is writing copy it's I think that's the most difficult thing so when somebody had giving you something that's already working I was on top of that so gotcha not bad yeah I mean it wasn't totally free I did charge you something but I, I yeah. yeah yeah kind of well I mean like I'm, I'm value. I feel like yeah when I yeah, definitely not free but I mean people can compile and offer which like, there's just so much value to it where, I mean, I feel like the value stopped where like we're jumping on calls every month and, and then I'm like, man, it's already worth the price. And now everything on top of that is just bonus. So yeah, that's how I jumped in. Nice. So tell me about this deal that you did after getting involved in, in my system. You said it's your, your best deal ever, biggest deal ever. What Talk me through yep. it. So yeah, deal here in Madison. I was a small two bed one bath 780 square feet and yeah she was going through a rough situation and she literally had like two weeks before she was going to lose all of her equity so i was able to meet with her write an offer on the spot uh, we came to an agreement closed on it like three weeks later i could have wholesaled it easily but i really try to run it where like i only i ended up putting 15 grand in this place so i bought it for 140 I put 15 into it. And then I literally, we had an offer within two weeks on the market for 230. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think I don't remember the check. I think it was like 53,000 something. And my previous deal before that, my highest was like 32. So, I mean, that's a big jump. <laughs> it's, but so many people say it can't be done, Sam. They're frustrated. What do you say to a frustrated person? I say, man, the first deal's around the corner <laughs> because it is. I mean, I tell you, like four months working to get my first deal, and then it happened. 
And then before I, literally two days before I sold that one, I got my next one under contract, which was a wholesale. And on that one, I made 22. And it's like, yeah, it's once that first one's done, it's crazy how I don't know what changes like confidence or whatever, but there's just so much that changes. Like now, you know, you can do it. Uh, that is, that's a hard thing to explain, but you're right. There's something shifts. My argument is I always tell my students, I say it tongue in cheek and I'll say it right now. There ain't nothing like the first time, right? First time's magical. First time's fantastic. It's great. But I think the mental shift that you're describing actually happens the second time. So the first time it's awesome, right? You did it. You proved it could work. Fantastic. But almost immediately after it's done, the little voice in the back of your head, that odd bit of self-doubt starts to seep in or other people start to go, oh, that was just a fluke. That was dumb luck. Lightning never strikes twice, et cetera, et cetera. And then you're slightly unsure, you know, is it true? Was it just dumb luck? Was it, you know, blind luck? But then when the second deal happens, you go, all right, wait a minute. Lightning doesn't strike twice, but it did. So it must mean that I have some level of control over this. And I find that after the first deal is great, but the second deal locks it into people and locks them in mentally where they go, yeah, I can do this. And that usually makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, no, completely. I do agree with that because yeah, again, after... I mean, you're on the phone all the time, especially before your first deal. And you're just like, it's really a bummer when you're, it's just like, it's a numbers game. You're talking to so many tire kickers. And then when I finally got that one, and then I had reassurance from people I was working with that it was a deal. Yeah, it does. It feels almost too good to be true. Like to even keep it up. Like there's one thing to get a deal like every couple of months, but to actually keep it up and like start turning into a business. Yeah, I do see what you're talking about, like a mental shift. It, it is yeah. hard to see. It really is. It's hard to see. It's hard for some people to believe. I mean, Sam, if you think about it, what do you say, 53,000, something like that? Yeah. 56,000. That's an annual salary for a lot of people. Yeah. And that was yeah. just one of multiple deals you did in the course of a year. So that changes your mentality. Yes, very yeah. much so. You mentioned it being a numbers game. Explain that. Yeah. Well, like I said, my first deal, it came after, it was 43 leads. I went through 43 leads. I had it all okay. there. And yeah, it's just, there's going to be so many no's, like an unbearable amount of no's. And yeah, it's like, it took me 43, 42 no's to get my 43rd yes. And I shouldn't even say that. Like, so there were some yeses in those 43, but they weren't deals. But to because, actually yeah. get to a real deal mm -hmm. where somebody's at a certain level of motivation and can agree on a price that works for both me and the seller, it's just numbers because there's so many people, their best option is to go list it. That's what they're going to do. They're like, again, like what we all call tire kickers. They would love the ease of selling to us at full price, but that's just not how it works. Like we're looking for those very select few people where, I mean, our service is serving them and that's what they need. That's the only reason anybody, and that's what was a really big shift for me is like, people are only going to sell to me if they need to sell to me. I'm like, they could Google any invest or realtor, but yeah. So it's just talking and talking and talking to people. Do you find that? Exciting or tedious? Man, I tell you, I'm sure you can relate, but my first hundred calls, are, I mean, it's still, I get nervous on the phone sometimes. It's a little tedious, but I just dial now. It's just like, it's, I just found that it's so much of a, con it's just having a conversation. There's no, like, there's a little bit of sales and like telling them what you do, why they sh could or should work with you, depending on their situation. But to answer your question, it's, so much more comfortable now. Like I would have never imagined it being this, I would not say easy on the phone, but it's so much, so much easier. It's straightforward. What do you think changed? Is it just the amount of practice, just the number of times you've done it, just the number of times you put up with the rejection or is it something else? Yeah. I mean, those all play part in it, but also like, I know I'm literally on that phone call to help somebody too. And I know I can help them. Like, I know if we agree on a price, like I am their guy, like I will get this property off your shoulder. So I would say, yeah, just having the sheer confidence of knowing that I can actually help them 
like especially after doing those first few deals that's yeah. that's really what changed it so is it did you struggle before talking with people before you were sure you could you know if they said yes that you could get the deal done yeah i mean yeah cuz i mean you really don't know right away yeah <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it always is like, even once you get under contract, like me, I have a little, I mean, I have a period where like I can back out because that is always kind of a thing. Like, yes, I'm here to help you. And I especially early on, like now I know I can tackle deals myself. So I try to get it to a point where like, even if I'm not wholesaling, I can buy it. But yeah, that was always a thing because I was wholesaling in the beginning and I knew I needed to find somebody else to actually make this deal close. So yeah, it was always, I guess, a little nerve wracking too. Okay. Now, 42 rejections, 42 people telling you no. Some of them probably not very polite about it either. Uh, <laughs> what does it take internally, Sam, to deal with that? Because I, I think the very thought of that scares the pants off a lot of people. Yeah, to be able to do it, I mean, I think it's being uh, in like a mastermind like yours, like we jump on calls every month, multiple times a month. And it's like, that's, I know, I, to be honest, to answer, that's exactly how I was able to put up with it because I was meeting with other investors and they were doing it and they deal with the same thing. Like I have leads that have submitted stuff to me and then I call them and are, are mad at me for calling when they submitted information. It doesn't matter, but it's just knowing that they're, you're always going to talk to those people. That is how business works. It's no, not everybody's pleasant. Most people aren't pleasant is what I've come, especially when they're in a tight situation. So yeah, it's just knowing that I have to talk to these people to get to the people that I can actually help. It's not always pleasant, but it's also not personal to you. People are angry, they're stressed out, they're whatever. That's on them. If they take it out on you, they take it out on you. You got to be a little bit, you know, like the stereotypical duck and water and just let it wash over you. Yep, exactly. And you won't let it wash over you the first time. Like I've been, I, exactly. It's not taking it personal because early on, I can tell you, I've had a conversation or two where I was like, dang that hurt but then i'm like i'm never going to talk to that person again so it doesn't yeah it's, <laughs> yeah. it's over so it's over. Uh, yeah. that hurt that was uncomfortable next yes exactly yeah. exactly I, that is what, what i want everyone listening to understand that is the exact attitude you have to get to that slightly like i just don't care anymore it doesn't personally hurt they're not really talking to me when you get to that point you become unstoppable because you're just you know what you got to do you have to put up with 42 rejections and then you get, you kiss 42 frogs, then you get your princess. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a game, play the numbers game. Exactly. But is it difficult? Tell me, Sam, be honest. At some point during those 42 rejections, does self-doubt kick in? Even though you're used to it now, even though you know this what it takes, is there kind of a, a dark hour? Yep, 100%. What do you do? you keep calling <laughs> <laughs> you get back on the phone i mean yeah because it it's like yeah a lot of rejection and then even when you do get a deal and it doesn't go through like that's that even like that's a even more rejection because you're like wow i just got a piece of paper signed somebody says they're going to sell me their house and then I mean, you find out oh there's actually this wrong with the house like i can't even pay that Mr. Seller, I actually have to pay this much. And it's like, it doesn't work out all the time. So I found out the hard way, like deals aren't done until everything's said and done until you're at the closing table. So it's just like any sales game. Cause I feel like that's what we mainly do. We market and then we sell and there's going to, it's a roller coaster until you really get such an influx of leads where you don't care. I mean, no, okay. I, I'd rather hear a quick no than a long maybe type situation. <laughs> I gotcha. I like that. Quick no is much better than a long maybe. Yeah, yeah. Then you know, and it's just no for now. What if you found, you know, you're saying marketing has been a big key that's opened things up for you, but I hear a lot of people complain that they're marketing isn't catching, isn't sticking, and there must be something wrong out there. There's there's no, you know, there's no deals to be had. What do you find? 
I mean, I find it with different types of marketing. I mean, marketing is a very low, unless you have some magical piece a piece of marketing that's just working phenomenally. That's what it is. Like I'm using your letters right now. And that one call that I got, that was a $53,000 deal. That was, I think I had sent thousands of letters. That was the one call I got actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, since then I've gotten more calls, but like when I first started, that was the one call I got. So, I mean, it is a low response rate for most types of marketing. I think the biggest thing is testing stuff, test everything. Yeah. And what's interesting is like that letter you used, my approach on the copywriting for it, my approach on getting the, the message right is we're trying to pre-filter. So you're only going to get the good calls, but that also means you get less calls. If you write something more general and less focused, you get more calls. But then I tend to find that people get burned out from dealing with a lot of tire kickers, a lot of long maybes, a lot of flat out no's. So you're better off going for the people that when they call, they're much more ready to go. The problem is you don't get as many calls. Right, yep. I do like that from your letters because I'll tell you like Facebook, I mean, it's a very blanket message looking to buy houses type thing. And I mean, it's filtering all those nasty calls out. So um, yeah. yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. honestly it is at this point like it is fun it is fun to be on the phone like it is way more enjoyable than I ever would have thought it would have been like now I'm at, I love being on the phone because now I know when I'm not on the phone now I know I'm not closing deals so I've got to be on the phone and that's I mean that's enjoyable at this point how have you improved your phone skills I mean if you're enjoying it now there's been an improvement what's improved your your skills on the phone yeah just Literally just one thing is like just having a conversation. Yes, there are like up scripts and stuff, very helpful asking specific questions, but really turning it into a conversation, like just talking to people because people like to work with people they trust. So just having a conversation, I would say like that was the biggest shift. I used to be very, very shy. You would have never, ever had me, I mean, doing any networking events, anything like that, it would be unheard of for me to do anything like that. But yeah, once I realized that you're just talking to people that have a house issue, it has just made it so much more streamlined. Like I'm not asking question after question. I'm just having a conversation with them, understanding what they need, what they want from their house and stuff. I'd say that just kind of making a conversation like. Okay. Is that something, is there a, a trick to getting them engaged in conversation? I'm thinking of someone who maybe is like you were before, shy, doesn't really love talking to people a bunch, but how does that person come out of their shell? Just truly repetition. It was literally repetition. I don't know what else it would have been. And then, yeah, not taking stuff personal. I think those two things, I just had to keep on doing it because I know my first 100, first 200 calls, I still wasn't comfortable. I still hated making the phone calls, but... Now, again, like I said, I'm excited because I don't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> I really don't care what they have to say. Like, I hope they're reasonable, but I mean, yeah. But whether they are, whether they aren't. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm making the call anyways. <laughs> yeah. Well, when there's 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars on the line, that's a nice carrot on the stick. Exactly. And that's where I don't care who I'm calling because. Again, what's the best part about this business? We're helping people, but to help people, like another quote, like I've loved following influencers and stuff. And it's like, he says, you are paid in proportion to the problems that you solve. And I mean, solving a housing issue, like that is the, some people's biggest purchase. Like we get paid very well for solving that issue. So yeah, I'm calling people with a smile on my face. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, again, I'm harping on the point, but it's a big turnaround for a lot of people is that, look, it's there. You got to put up with the rejection, play the numbers game, get yourself comfortable, because that's where you get to help people, which is the good part. And you get to make money, which is the good part. And they get their problem solved, which is a good part. And it's basically winners all the way around. Nobody loses. Exactly. And that's what I love about it. Yeah, that I think the lesson I tease out of all that is, and this is the strangest thing to say, but get to the point where you don't care anymore. When you don't care, it shows there's a quiet confidence in you. And then you find more 
people. So like I said, when I first trained you, I said, as we get good at negotiation, you get good talking to people, you get good packaging up deals, you get good persuading them to say yes and getting them off the fence, that builds a quiet confidence in you. And once that confidence kicks in, suddenly you start getting more deals and you don't even know why. It's because that that confidence that you barely noticed because it gradually sprouted up on you, but it, it comes across quietly, subtly, and kind of almost under the radar to the people that you're talking to. Yeah, I agree. And to add on to that, yeah, I could not agree more because, I mean, even early on, like I just graduated college. I didn't have a job. I was like frantically looking for a deal. Like I didn't want to go get a job. I was like hard, like trying to find a deal. And that can come off as like desperate and stuff on over the phone in meetings and stuff. So yeah, like you said, like get to a point where, yeah, you don't care. You don't need the deal. Like you'll take it if it works out for everybody. But like, yeah, I think people respond very, very well to that. Yeah. It's yes, you want to do a deal, but no, you don't need to do this one specific deal. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a, if you think through that, there's a mental shift in that. Yeah. Doing a deal is important, but not this specific deal. So now you care without caring, right? You can come across, it doesn't matter. There's another one. I mean, there literally is, no matter what happens in the economy, no matter what happens with interest rates or anything else, there are people getting into trouble that need to get out of their houses. That's just a fact of life. Yep. What else are you focusing on in terms of different types of deals? What are you after now? Yeah, so I'm working on this big rehab about like an hour from where I'm at. And honestly, it's helped me to realize what I like to do. And I, I this is a big rehab, 65 grand. I love wholesaling. Like, I feel like I'm running back to wholesaling right now and wholesaling. I don't mind sticking 10, 20 grand into a house. But when you start digging into stuff, it's just, I mean, yeah, you can make more money, but I'm like, what I'm projected to make on this, like I've made plenty more on like you know, wholesale or wholesales and stuff. So I'm really trying to add more marketing streams, really trying to build a business. But I think it's, I really want to start focusing solely on the wholesale, wholesale. I learned a lot on this rehab and I think that's just where I find my place because I've already done that the, these and I think that's just where I want to stick for now. I'll take on a rehab, but I think it has to, the numbers really have to speak to me if I'm going to do that. Gotcha. So it's an exit strategy, which when you choose, does any of your inbound change? If you decide I want to do more wholesales, get back to wholesaling or hoteling, what about rehabs? Does anything on the front end of your business change? Oh yeah, all the same. That's what I think people miss. So there's this obsession with exit strategy. Like, oh, I don't want to learn that time because I want to rehab or I want to do Airbnb or I want to do commercial. Gang, there's no difference. We have to find motivated sellers. And then how we exit out is our choice later on. You still have to find the deal. You have to negotiate the deal. Then you put it on a contract and figure out what you want to do with it, whether you wholesale it, wholesale it, rehab it, hang on to it as a landlord or be especially landlord with an Airbnb or something. That all comes after the fact. The inbound strategy is the same. Yep, exactly. And that's where, yeah, it's just literally just market. Like that is this, the entirety of this business revolves around marketing. And I actually have your piece of paper up here. I ripped it off. Like when I first started going through, it says the always be marketing mindset. Cause I've been in a position where I've finished up my first deal or not, no, sorry, this is actually after my second deal. And then there was a period of three months, I'm frantically looking for another. And part of it was like, I got comfortable. I just did my first two deals. I was excited. But yeah, now I'm in a position, I will never stop having leads come in. Like that's the death of your business, really. Yeah, that's the trickiest thing for people. Sam, I know I I said to you, I've said it to every student, you have to keep marketing even when you are working on your first deal. And even when you're working on your second deal, you still got to keep your marketing machine moving. Once you get that marketing machine up and running, keep it well oiled and and keep it full of fuel because you don't want to stop it. Otherwise, it's so easy to stop because you get wrapped up in a rehab or wrapped up in a deal or wrapped up in whatever. But if no marketing occurs, then when that deal finishes and the payout is there, that's great. But you're right back to square one with your marketing and you've lost all your momentum. Exactly. And it hurts bad. (laughs) It's an easy trap to fall into. So it's not, again, but you realize it now, you've you've gotten that lesson down, you know, moving. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sam, you mentioned a term that I want to make sure we define for everybody. So we talked about wholesaling. I think most people probably understand that. We're going to put the property on the contract. And rather than close on it ourselves and then rehabbing it ourselves, or rather than closing on ourselves and then holding on to it as a rental, we sell it to somebody else who wants to rehab it or someone else that wants to rent it out. So that's wholesaling. We're basically marketing for the deal, negotiating the deal, and then selling it to another investor to let them perform the other exit strategies that we chose not to do. That's wholesaling. But you mentioned the word wholetaling. That's gotten more popular the last few years as a term. Can you define wholetaling for us? Yeah, it's basically, yeah, the mix between like a wholesale and a retail sale. It's um, right in the middle. You buy it. The how they were in a tight situation. You bought them out of the house. Now you're a lot of times it's maybe it's just cleaning out junk. That's what I did with my first place. Literally helped me, my brothers, my mom. We cleaned the place out when we relisted it. It's literally just getting it retail ready with like minimal amount of money. And so, yeah, you buy it. And then you put on the MLS retail, they, yeah, they just sell. I mean, it's as easy as that. And you're making more than you would wholesaling it. Like you might, like I've had somewhere I could make 10 grand wholesaling, but then I went and put two grand into it and then made 32 from just very small amounts of work or cleanup. Got you. Now, what are the details on this? Are you able to assign those contracts or, I mean, are these retail buyers coming from the MLS. So the, do they need to get bank financing? Does that cause you any hiccups? So yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. So I actually close on the house. I purchase it. Then I do the work and then I have an agent and they'll list it. Yes. And then normally. Yeah. So then you'll sell it. They'll need financing most likely unless you get cash offers, which can happen, but it is your, it's an on market property. Now you found the deal through your own marketing and now you're giving it to the masses through the MLS. After doing a little bit of light work and sometimes there might be, have you come across any issues where you haven't owned it long enough? Like they, you know, their financing says, wait a minute, you, the owners only owned it for a few months. Do they make you wait longer for their seasoning? I've heard of that. I've never ran into that, oddly enough. I don't know if you've had different experience, but I've heard of that happening before. I think it was like with first time home buyers or something, you just bought it and you're selling it. But luckily, yeah, I've never ran into that. Good. It's not always enforced. I mean, it's not a legal, it's not a law thing. It's just a lot of times the banks don't like lending on it. So it's up to them if they choose to have heartburn over that or not yeah, at the sure. end of the day, if it, the house is solid. So how do you determine if that's like, if the house is totally run down, piece of junk, dilapidated and clearly needs rehab, then that's a whole sale for you. If it's in decent shape, just maybe full of junk, you can get in there and clean it out and you hold talent. Is that, is that how you make your decision? Yep. Yeah. Literally just, yeah. Property basis, just run it a couple of different ways, get feedback from like my realtor partner, but yeah, if it's a rehab, especially now, I'm just going to wholesale it. And then, yeah, if it's just these smaller type things, yeah, I'll immediately wholesale. That's my go-to. Gotcha. And since you've actually owned the property, because you close on it first, I know people have questions. So are you financing that purchase or are you buying it outright with cash? Are you borrowing that money? How does it work for you? Yep. So I'm buying it. So private lenders, I have a couple of private lenders that I've met again, just through my local RIA. And so I used the hard money lender before, but yeah, it's always a cash deal, either through private money or hard money. Yeah. And then now that you've owned it and you're on the title and you've sold it in substantially less than a year and a day, you're subject to more taxes, you're subject to short-term capital gains. Has that been an issue? Has that come to bite you? Yeah, I do pay short-term capital gains, but I just made 32 grand. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't get the money to pay the tax bill. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. So yeah, you do. I do pay all that. Of course, don't want to get in trouble with the big guys, but <laughs> yeah. Awesome. What are you working on in your business now? What's your biggest struggle? Hiring somebody. I really want to turn into a business. Cause like I've been doing this for over three years now, about three and a half years. And yeah, I just, I really want to turn into a business. 
something like that. I need to have some people on my team. I don't know what that looks like yet. I'm trying to figure it out, but yeah, that's my next step. Yeah. Have you hired anyone so far or you, and, and it hasn't worked or are you just kind of thinking about that's the next step? Yep. Haven't hired anybody. Yeah. Just thinking that's the next step and how to do it successfully. I know I just started like really diving deep into it and I don't know what I need on my end, like processes and all this type of stuff. I'm yeah, I'm really just jumping into it right now. Yeah. No, that's a good start. I think a lot of people, when you get to the intermediate to advanced level, you start thinking about team, you start thinking about systems, uh, protocols, procedures, the first step, honestly, Sam, start to write out what you do. Even if it's a little tedious at first, you write it out and then you look at it and go, I guess I can get somebody else to do that. And then you can start to look for competent people to do it. Uh, so it's, I've done that. I guess I'm on my third round, a third level now of assistance and helpers on things. And it, it just, as your business matures over time, sometimes you start to mature away from the, the team you had, you mature into the next team, eventually you'll outgrow them and you keep moving your way up. Okay. Gotcha. But it's a, it's a good growth sign that you're at the point where you recognize you need that because that means your business is maturing. Yeah, yeah. Is that a lot of VAs that you work with or just local? It can be both. Depends what you need. So when you write out what you do, if it's something that, if it, honestly, if it's computer work, it could easily be done with a VA. If it's something kind of physical on site, then, you know, also obviously you got to have somebody in your local area that can do it. But okay. I find that most of the tedious stuff tends to be more computer work or even the marketing research or some of the marketing automation. If you can find a software to do it, use the software. But if you need a person to do it, then use a VA because it's amazing what you can do remotely. You know, if it's all computer work anyway, it doesn't matter where the person is or where the computer is, you can make it happen. Okay. Yeah, true, true. Awesome. So what's next overall? What are your, you know, you're still you're young, a couple of years out of college, things are going well. What do you see? What are your ultimate goals from the business and life in general? Yeah, business life. Yeah, really turn this into an actual business. And I really want to get into long term, like tax benefit type real estate. So really get into long term holds. I've never had to go to a bank for any of my deals. So really start like finding out my borrowing power and stuff like that. And then in personal life, I would really like to get more into like virtual, like I think that's where I need to take my business to is almost virtual because I mean, here in Wisconsin, it's fun and everything, but I'd love to be able to travel. I would love to like move somewhere warmer, <laughs> but like my whole business is here. I do all my flips here in Madison, Wisconsin, my wholesale, like my everything resolves, revolves around here. So business and life, I would really like to take this to a next level, get, maybe get some people on my team and then yeah, really start because I'm like, why did I jump into real estate entrepreneurship? It was because of freedom. And like, I'm wrapped in the business every single day. And I would not that I, I want to still be an operator of it. But yeah, I, I really want to take it to that next level. You know, Sam, there's going to be a lot of uh, jealous people listening going, wait a minute, kid's 25 years old. He's never had a job after college and he's turning good deals. So <laughs> What would you say to someone when they say, oh, I want to get started, but I'm stuck. What do I do? Man, I just to say, make sure if you're not part of a coaching group, mastermind group, start there and then start marketing, start listening immediately to what they're teaching you and find somebody to keep you accountable, which normally that group will be. You just meet somebody from that group, tell them you want to work together. Like I think early on it was accountability. I would say I was going to do something, I wouldn't do it. But then when I started telling like my coach that I'm going to have this done before the end of the week, then I had to do it. I didn't want to show up and be a liar, basically. But yeah, I would say get around people and just start marketing. I know you always talk about it doesn't matter what the marketing is. Just do something. Yeah, I try to, you know, I, I say that to people and the, the risk is that you make it sound like, yeah, oh, it doesn't matter, just do something. Oh, well, I mean, obviously do something focused. But it's always better to start and be doing any of my prescriptions rather than nothing. So it's not just do any, do some focus things. And it's, it's obvious what the focus you choose. I give people 85 different things. So it's not that you have to do all 85. It's just so that you can't say, I don't know what to do. Well, sure. There's 85 different what's. Just choose which ones and then get moving on it. 
And yeah, and building in that accountability piece, which is one of the reasons I like to reach out to my students on a regular basis, have you on the calls, have you on the Zooms. That way, I know how some people are. They're not doing their homework till the night before. But you know what? It's fine. It's still getting done. And that's what matters. Yep, exactly. What would you say to someone who's sitting on the fence? You know, they're not sure they need training. They're not sure they should join my program. They're not sure. They're just sitting there kind of frozen in fear. What do you say to them? I would say if you're actually not serious, don't do it. But if you're actually serious and I mean, it comes down to like, if you just want change in your life, I mean, just pull the trigger. I really think it's as simple as that. You have to do something different if you want your life to be different. So I would say just do it. I mean, there is so much value. I mean, in your program, I don't like you just give everything away <laughs> like that. Again, that's why I joined because I was like simple enough, like I can start plugging in this marketing. And I mean, it's obviously paid dividends already. So yeah, I'll be around. Cool. <laughs> well, good. That's what I'm trying to get people to make a move. And I do put an enormous amount of value. I always argue it's extremely over delivered because I remember what it was like when I had nothing. And I didn't want to just start taking random information from the internet and try to hope it works. I wanted to take a focus system that I knew was working for other people and then make it work for myself. And that was hard to find. So I've built my total traction system to be, here's everything you need with one missing element. It's you. It just needs you. It needs you to do it. I can't make it grow arms and legs and work on its own. It needs you. So if you're ready to be you and do it, then it's ready for you. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I'll like, Again, early in college, like I had spent like small amounts of money on like little mentorship stuff and they didn't help because I was not working on anything. Like they had all the information there. I just, I was not implementing anything. So yeah, like, as you said, if you are ready, then do it. But if you're not ready, don't do it because it works. I mean, there, like I've listened to your other podcasts. I'm like, there's no doubt it works. I mean, it just does. It's one of the things I always hear is like good artists copy, great artists steal. And it's like when you're able to jump into a, a mentorship like this, you are literally able to steal everything exactly how you're doing it and create replicate your business. So I think it's the most powerful thing. Mentorships, masterminds, it's the only reason I'm where I'm at is because I've been able to take stuff that's working for you and just do it in my business. I love it. Sam, totally awesome. Thanks very much. Thanks for your candor. I appreciate you being here. Yes, thank you, Zeke.